your name. You're my strength. Yes, you are. You're my strength. Ooh. You're my strength. Hey. And I forever praise your Say. name. Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to Midweek. We live in the Midwest where it can be sunny and warm, and in a few hours the weather changes to snowy and cold. But you know what? We serve a God who does not change. And every time we come to this place, we get to feel His presence when we come together. I'm so grateful. 
few announcements. Next Tuesday, it's going to be our family prayer right here in the sanctuary at 6.30. It is a great time we have. Uh, we start at 6.30. Come. Maybe you can't stick it out the whole time. That's okay. Come and pray with us for a while and then, and then head out when you need. But that's family prayer this coming Tuesday at 6.30. Sunday, April 14th, 14th, we're going to have our dedication Sunday. We know that our children are a gift from God, and we're just going to dedicate them back to the kingdom of God. We don't, we don't baptize as babies, but we do dedicate them back to, to the Lord. And when they're at the age of their own decision, that's when they would choose to be baptized. So if you would like to be a part of that, you have a child you would like to give back to God, there's a QR code on the screen or you can go to the, Q, the sanctuaryqc.com under the events page. You'd be able to sign up there as well. It's prayer time. There's going to be some needs on the screen. Maybe you got a need. Maybe you got a situation. You got a sickness you're dealing with or someone in your family. You just want someone to pray with you. Just lift your hand. That's all we need. We just need to see a hand that is lifted. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna join together with you and let our faith connect with yours and watch God do the miraculous in every one of our situations in our needs. Would you pray with me right now? Jesus, I love you and I thank you. I give you all the glory and all the honor. God, I, I'm so grateful that I could call on you. God, each and every day you've heard, oh God, every time I've called your name, when I've been sick, God, when I've been dealing with situations, I've cried out to you and you've been there each and every time, oh God. You've seen every hand that was lifted in this place. I'm believe in you right now that you're going to begin to to make a way in every one of those needs and every one of those situations God I know you're able we serve a great big God you see every name that's on the list God Carlos God needs a miraculous touch oh God from the report he received <clears throat> justice needs a touch Cindy needs a touch oh God or Mary and Martha God I'm just believing you God every one of these names on this list we're going to place them into your hands and trust that you're a God who's able. We give you all the glory and we thank you, Jesus, for being a prayer answering God. In your mighty name we pray. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing And you're desperate for some healing Let me tell you about my Jesus Oh He takes away with rain away Rises up from an empty grave Ain't no sinner that he can't save Let me tell you about your past to disappear oh let me tell you about my jesus and all the wrong turns that you would go and undo if you could but who could work it out for your good oh let me tell you about my jesus he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave ain't no sinner that he can't save Tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And then my 
much about me Let me tell you about my Jesus Oh, he makes a way where there ain't no way Rises up from an empty grave Ain't no sinner that he can't save Let me tell you about my Jesus His love, His love is strong change that you produced in us by your power and your spirit. Praise God. We honor you tonight, Jesus. We worship you. You're so good. Hallelujah. Thank you for the life change. Thank you for the transformation, Lord. We worship you and we praise you in Jesus' name. I was reading yesterday about the transfiguration on the mount of, of the transfiguration of Christ and what a type and a shadow that is that one day uh, we're, we're transformed now by the washing of blood, by the washing away of our sins and the infilling of the Spirit. We're transformed now. But one day we're going to be ultimately transformed in, 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 when we're caught up together to meet Him in the air. We're going to be like Him. One day this old flesh is going to pass away. One day this, this old body, this old temple is going to pass away, this body that aches and pains and feels cold and heat and snow and rain. And one day it's going to, that's all going to be gone. One day we're going to be transformed to be like him. I can't wait for that day. How about you? What a day that will be when my Jesus I will see. Amen. Amen. It's offering time at the sanctuary. The ushers are coming very quickly. One quick announcement as our ushers uh, come prepare to receive our offering. This Sunday, I'll be kicking off a new series uh, this week. And uh, this series will, it will be launching off of our Easter message that I preached, Come and See. And this series, we're calling it See for Yourself, Grasping God's Vision for Your Life. What does God want for your life? Have you ever wondered, God, what do you want for my life? In this series, we're going to be talking about what God wants for our life so you don't want to miss it. We will also be updating. We'll be treating this Sunday as the first Sunday of the month and, uh, and giving you our greater than update on this Sunday so you don't want to miss that. Thank you for your faithfulness uh, in, in your giving. We're excited about uh, what God is doing in our church, and we know that God's covenant blessing is tied to how we live our life, the details of our life. God cares about a lot in our life. God cares about our stewardship. I'm thankful that we can honor God with our stewardship. Would you help me pray over this offering? Jesus, we love you. Lord, I thank you right now for your mercy and your goodness. I pray that you would bless every gift and that you would bless every giver. God, bless, bless those that faithfully tithe and give of their offerings, those that are giving of their greater than pledges, God, to further your kingdom, not only in the Quad Cities, but around the world. God, I pray that you would bless them and increase them, God, so that we can further your message. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And let everyone say amen. Amen. Take about 60 seconds. Step out and give. Us are here. You can give online. Instructions are on the screen. Greet somebody near you during that time.
out. You should have received a lesson handout when you walked in, and yet you can be seated. If you need one, just lift your hand, and the ushers will expedite one to you. We're glad to have our youth in here tonight. Give it up for our sanctuary youth in here joining us tonight. Feels, uh, feels good to have them back in here once in a while. And tonight, as we've been announcing, we are going to cover the topic of communion, and we're going to, at the conclusion of the service, we're going to receive communion together. So we wanted our uh, youth to be in here for that, and uh, already had a, a brief and abbreviated communion service with our Sanctuary Kids staff that was downstairs in a beautiful time uh, down there, even uh, much earlier in this evening. And so I'm excited about what God is going to do here tonight. The concept of communion. The concept of communion. 1 Corinthians 11 will be the text that we will take. And I'll read through this. I believe it's printed in your notes. You can follow along. For I received from the Lord, Paul writes, that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he, took out, uh, he, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then verse 27, he says, Therefore, Whoever eats of this bread or drinks of this cup in an unworthy manner, the King James says, whoever does so unworthily will be guilty of the blood and the the body and the blood of the Lord. Paul was writing here to the Corinthian church here in 1 Corinthians, and he's addressing some issues that are hindering them from forward progress in their relationship with God. How many have ever felt like in your walk with God you were at a standstill? Be honest. How many have ever felt like you were at a standstill? How many have ever felt like you were kind of hitting a brick wall, like you couldn't get any further in your relationship with God? Paul's addressing some of this, what's keeping them from forward progress. And he's writing to this church at Corinth that is a church that has great potential, but sometimes with great potential comes great problems. And they had great potential as a church, but they were also wrestling with some very real problems. And this church that was at a literal physical crossroads, it was at a seaport. It was at a place where people were coming and going. People were deciding whether they were leaving or they were staying. It was at a physical crossroads, but it was also a place that was a spiritual crossroads. And he's writing to them, this, this church that is at a physical crossroads, but he's writing also to them that they are at a spiritual crossroads. And he's making it clear that if, if you want to be who God wants you to be, and I think that would be all of us here, tonight. And if you want to be what God wants you to be, you want to fulfill God's purpose in your life, you're going to have to get this stuff right. And and, and so he talks to them in chapter 11 about the Lord's Supper. We call it commonly the Lord's Supper or communion or Eucharist. Uh, it, It takes place at the time right before Jesus' death. So If we would rewind, we just came through Easter Sunday, and if we would rewind about a week or so, that's when this setting was taking place. It's at the end of his life, before the crucifixion, before the cross, and he's giving us this reminder. He gives us a reminder, and Christ gives us, before he goes to the cross, he he gives us a reminder, and he gives us a couple of prayer requests as well. The memorial of this broken body, of his broken body, and the memorial of the shed blood, which was the the bread, the unleavened bread, and the fruit of the vine, the juice or the wine. And he said, 
as often as you do this, do in remembrance of me. Now, if you have your Bible still open to 1 Corinthians 11, we're going to uh, just kind of work our way through some of this as we try to understand the concept of communion. There are many things we do uh, as a church that, that we, we derive from Scripture, but we don't always slow down to explain why we're doing what we're doing. So tonight, what I want to do, sometimes you know we take communion on Sundays. Uh, I looked back, and, and a couple of years ago, I think it was in 2021, that we took communion on a Tuesday night Thanksgiving service when we uh, used to have those Tuesday night Thanksgiving services. Uh, and so we took it in a midweek at that time. But sometimes it's good to slow down and talk about why we do what we do, to really comprehend what we do. And, and, and communion is something that is commanded. It's something uh, that is our privilege to take part in as the body of Christ. But I want to know why, and I want you to know why we do what we do when we take communion. First, as we understand the concept of communion, I'm going to give you uh, five components of the concept of communion, understanding and comprehending communion. First, we must understand that communion is about submission. Communion begins with submission. He said, he took the cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood, this do. He didn't give them uh, really much of an option there. He commanded that they would take part in communion. Can I help us here tonight and let you know that not just in communion, but in every area of your walk with God, submission is a high value target in your relationship with God. Obedience is required in your relationship with God. The further we go in the timeline of humanity and the closer we march towards the rapture of the church, the more concepts like obedience and submission sound really ancient. They sound really archaic because our world is living in a state of rebellion. Rebellion against any authority, rebellion against all authority, rebellion against governmental authority, rebellion against school authority, uh, even school, I mean, I, I'm not that old, I know our youth may think I'm an old man, but I'm really not an old man, but I, re, I remember going to school in just a few decades ago when I was scared to look at my teacher crossways. I, I was scared she'd slap the eyeballs out of my face. And now you've got students just completely disrespecting, even attacking teachers, and just a complete disregard for authority, just a complete disregard for authority, a, a, a complete disregard for political authority. The, the climate that we're in politically is just it's astounding. It's, un, it's unprecedented in North America. It's been seen around the world. But the astounding just irreverence and disrespect for any form of governmental authority, police authority, anything of the sort, just complete disregard for any law, order, authority, and control. Can I tell you as a disciple of Jesus Christ, you cannot be a disciple of Jesus Christ without a concept of obedience and submission. And submission, you've heard me say it before, submission only comes into play when we disagree. Submission only comes into play when, when there's a conflict of desire. When I want one thing, but the Lord says do this, or my authority figure in my life says do this. That's when submission, submission is not submission when you agree. That's called agreement, and that's wonderful too. There's, there's a place for agreement, but obedience and submission are required in our relationship with God. Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 7. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. He said, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in the name? We cast out devils. We not done many wonderful works. He said, I'll profess to them, I never knew 
you. I didn't know you. In other words, I wasn't in relationship with you. Relationship with God begins with faith and immediately leads to obedience of the gospel message. Relationship with God begins with faith that propels us to obedience. He said in John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. I'm going to say it over and over again. We have to be obedient and we have to understand submission in God's economy to be pleasing to God. Those might be dirty words in our culture. Obedience, submission, they're dirty words. They're curse words in our culture, but they're not curse words in God's economy. They're beautiful concepts in God's economy. And I must be in obedience and in submission to his will and his way. Obedience, submission, communion is about submission. Communion is also about proclamation. Not only did Jesus say, do this, but he said, when you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When we partake in communion, part of what we are doing is we are proclaiming, we are declaring that we are covenant children of Jesus Christ. We are proclaiming that we are in covenant relationship with him. Hebrews says, but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much he also is the mediator of a better covenant. Everybody say a better covenant. Which was established upon better promises. Brothers and sisters, we're a part of the New Testament church. We're a part of the church of the living God. Jesus Christ, who died, was buried, and rose again, shed his blood, and came out of the grave victorious so that you and I could be part of a better covenant. Not the covenant of old. We're not dragging bulls and goats and sheep and bringing them for sacrifice in the temple and the spilling of blood, but the blood of that spotless lamb was shed once and for all. It was shed for your sins. It was shed for my sins. We are part of a better covenant. We are a part of a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. We're part of a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. And when we partake in communion, Communion, the concept of communion is the concept of proclamation. We are proclaiming that covenant. We are declaring when we, when we drink of the fruit of the vine and we eat of the bread of the body, we are proclaiming that we are a part of that new covenant, that New Testament covenant of that body that was broken and that blood that was shed. Mark chapter 15, and Jesus cried with a loud voice. Watch what happens here. Communion is about proclamation, I'm saying. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. In other words, it was tore from, from top to bottom. That, that veil of the temple that a team of oxen literally could not pull apart. God, with his finger, ripped it from heaven to earth, signifying that, that his, it was his work. It was the finished work at Calvary that was allowing access from heaven to earth to his presence. The veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. And the centurion, watch this, that soldier, which stood over against him, saw. And when he saw this, he saw this, he cried out as Jesus gave up the ghost. And he said, truly, this man was the son of God. He proclaimed it in that very moment out of his own lips. Truly, this man was the son of God. From that proclamation until the proclamation that Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians 11 that we proclaim the Lord's death. Brothers and sisters, when you have an encounter with the resurrected Savior, when you have an encounter with the shed blood of Jesus Christ, when you have an encounter with the cross of Calvary, you become a proclaimer of this new covenant. When you have an encounter with Jesus that changes your life, you cannot keep it quiet. 
Scripture says they were, told, they were told to tell no one, but what did they do? They went around and they started telling. Look at what Jesus did. Hey, when Jesus does something like that for you, like the man who is leaping and dancing and praising God, and, and, and they're trying to argue about this or that, was it lawful or not, and yet he's leaping and dancing and praising God. When you have a miraculous encounter with the resurrected Christ, you become a proclaimer of this new covenant. You become... A, a proclaimer of what Jesus has done. Communion is about proclamation. I, I question sometimes about somebody's real, genuine experience or not with Jesus. If you haven't shared it with anybody, if you're living your life incognito, young people, if you're going to school, and you're in your neighborhood, and you're okay with nobody knowing that you're one of those Jesus believers, that you're spirit-filled, that you live a little differently, that's a problem. When you partake in this new covenant, we're to become proclaimers of that covenant. He said, you proclaim the Lord's death. Why am I proclaiming the Lord's death? Because it's the Lord's death that purchased my freedom. It's the Lord's death that can purchase their freedom. It's the Lord, when I proclaim his covenant, I'm declaring that, hey, what Jesus did for me, Jesus can do for you. What Jesus did in my life, he can do in anybody's life. He's no, aren't you thankful he's no respecter of persons, uh, that if he's done it for one, he can do it for all. Somebody ought to give him praise right now. Lord, I thank you. God, I give you praise. I thank you for the opportunity to proclaim. Hallelujah. I thank you for the opportunity to proclaim what you've done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is no respecter of persons, and he can do it for anybody in this room. Communion is about Submission. The concept of communion is about proclamation. And the concept of communion is about commemoration. Verse 25 says, This do, as often as you drink, do it in remembrance of me. Remember. Now, there's probably some in here that have better memories than some others in here. How many struggle with remembering sometimes? Remember where you put keys. Remember how many, how many habitual car key losers do we have in here? You don't have to raise your hand. Or cell phone misplacers. <laughs> yeah. We misplace things. We forget, I, I'm, I'm terrible. I, I've, got, I've got the worst memory sometimes about things. And it just, you know, I, I have to keep good notes because if I don't keep good notes, I, I, I don't remember things very well. We, as humanity, are sometimes not good about remembering the things that matter. Have you ever forgotten your spouse's birthday? Have you ever forgotten your, see, I've got it easy there. My spouse and I have the same birthday. And so, I don't know, some of you know that, some of you didn't. We have the same birthday. And I knew my memory was so bad, so I just, uh, I just searched every dating app I could find until I found someone that had April 24th, and then I, I'm just kidding. When we dated, there was no internet, there was no dating app, so. I said, when I found somebody that had my birthday, that's one less date I had to remember. I said, marry me, sign me up. And she just happened to be really pretty, really wonderful. But. We're bad at remembering sometimes things that matter. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Until now, the observation of this Passover supper was done in remembrance of what God did for Israel in Egypt. What he did for Israel in Egypt. Can I tell you, God can work 
on behalf of his people, even when they're surrounded by Egypt. God can work in and for his people. He said, you are in this world, but you are not of this world. God can work for and through and with his people, even when they're in Egypt. And the feast, this, this feast that was now to be a feast of covenant and a feast uh, uh, of remembrance. This, this covenant was the covenant of, of fellowship. This remembrance was reaching back to what God had done for them when they were in Egypt. And, and Jesus was simply saying that receiving these portions, this symbolic, this, this fruit of the vine and this, this bread, you're participating, you're entering into covenant relationship by participating in his death, but you're also remembering, you're commemorating. It's about commemoration. It's about reaching back and remembering what God did for you, not just as a type of Israel coming out of Egypt, but just like Israel came out of Egypt, God, by his death and burial and resurrection, has broken our bondage of sin. Just like he delivered them from bondage in Egypt, he's delivered you from the bondage of sin and guilt and shame and death. And he said, when you do this, you do this out of commemoration. You remember, you commemorate that I am the God. God who brought you out. And just as Israel was delivered from death and bondage, you have been delivered from death and bondage. Just as they were delivered from a cruel taskmaster, sin is a cruel taskmaster. And you and I have been delivered by the blood of Jesus uh, from the cruel taskmaster of sin. We have been delivered. And so we do this in remembrance. We've been delivered from captivity into eternal life. I'm so thankful for the Holy Ghost. I'm so thankful for his blood that was shed. We're, we're prone to forget. We're prone to be preoccupied. We're, we're prone to, to not, not remember, to not keep it at the front of our mind what Jesus has done in our lives. We're prone to forget the price that he paid and the, the blessings. You know, we take blessings for granted sometimes. But we're commanded in communion to pause, reflect, to remember. To, to remember, to commemorate the suffering and the death that paid the price that you could have the goodness of God in your life. It was purchased for our salvations, not just our sins, but purchased for the sins of the entire world. He purchased our salvation. It's a time of reflection. It's a time of introspection. It's a time of soul searching. Israel is wandering in the wilderness right after they've been delivered. Think about this. They've been delivered from Egypt. God's brought them through a sea on dry ground. And now they're wandering in the wilderness and God said, you were unmindful and you forgot me. They've literally just come out of the most historic, monumental deliverance. Hollywood special effects couldn't hold anything to what the Lord did at the Red Sea. And he said in Deuteronomy 32, you are unmindful. You've forgotten the God who fathered you. In other words, when you didn't have a father, when you had, what, what's, what's the father concept? The father concept is a defender and a deliverer. He said, you, you, didn't have, you were in bondage. You had no one to defend you, to deliver you, and to bring you out. And I fathered you. I, I brought you out of bondage. I, I pulled you out of the pit of despair. I brought you out of bondage by those cruel taskmasters, but you forgot. You forgot. Psalm said, Psalm as David said in, in 106, he said, they did not remember the multitude of your mercies, but they rebelled by the sea. They didn't remember 
Deuteronomy chapter 6 says, uh, God told him, he said, you're going to inherit cities that you didn't build. You're going to build, you're going to live in houses that you didn't build. You're going to have houses that are full of good things that you didn't have to buy. But God was saying, when you're blessed, you better remember the God that blessed you. Uh, When you're honored, you better remember the God that honored you. What I'm telling the church tonight is communion is about commemoration and remembrance. And when we take of the cup, uh, we better remember the God that blessed us. uh, The God that dug us out of a pit of sin. uh, The God that brought us out of bondage uh, into his marvelous light. uh, The God that we would have no good thing if it wasn't for his blessing. Uh, We would have no good gifts if it wasn't for his mercy and his goodness. We better remember. We better remember, you don't just have a good job because you're smart and talented and gifted. Because the car that ran the red light that could have taken you out 30 years ago, God prevented it. And so the job that you have, the air that you breathe, the life that you live, it's by the mercy of God. We better remember. It's the goodness of God. It's not of my own doing. The car that you drive, the house that you live in, it's not just because you're that good, you're that righteous, and you deserve all the blessings you have. Because God could have let that accident happen. God could have let that thing transpire that would have taken you out a long time ago. But you're here by the grace of God. You're here by the mercy of God. You know what we do? We remember, we commemorate that sure there's things in your life you want to be better. There's things in your life you wish were fixed. There's things in your life you wish were different. But in communion, we pause and commemorate the blessing of God, the mercy of God, the goodness of God, that if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, where would I be? We commemorate. I think we ought to lift our hands right now and just thank Him for His blessing for a moment. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus, for your blessing, your mercy, and your goodness. My, my, my. That's why we honor him with our worship. That's why we honor him by showing up on a Wednesday night midweek. That's why we honor him with our finances and our resources. That's why we honor him. Because when I think of the price he paid and I think of what he's done in my life, I think that he could have let it all fall apart a long time ago. He could have let me be taken out a long time ago. And so when I understand that, it becomes very easy to seek God first. It becomes very easy to honor God first. Communion is about commemoration. It's about remembrance. We're in danger of forgetting. I don't have time to, uh, to read all the references that I have here tonight, but Second Peter 1, he said, if you lack in these things, he said, some, some people have forgotten. He said, you're short-sighted even to blindness. You, you, you forgot that God forgave you of your sins, that God brought you out, that God changed you li- your life. And he said, because of that, you become spiritually blind and you go back. Forgetfulness leads to spiritual blindness. Oh my, I wish I had time to talk about this right now. Forgetfulness leads to spiritual blindness. That's what 2 Peter says. When you, when you forget the goodness of God, you become spiritually blind to what he's trying to do in your life. When you forget the mercy and the blessing of God, you become spiritually blinded to the pitfalls that Satan would lay to ensnare you. When you become spiritually blind, when you become forgetful, you're, you're in danger of going back to that old life. That's why he said you are bought with a price. You should glorify God in your body and in your life. Don't forget, don't forget that you belong to Jesus Christ. Don't forget that you are bought with his blood. Don't forget that you are not your own. Communion, communion commemorates. It's all about commemoration and remembrance. Communion also is about anticipation. Verse 26, he said, you proclaim the Lord's death until, until what? Until he comes. Verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 11. 
For as often as you eat this bread, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Brothers and sisters, when we partake in communion, we do so in anticipation that this world is not our final home. That this is not our final destination. If this world was our final destination, you know how miserable that would be? I mean, look at our world. We have the promise of a better place. We have the assurance that one day, that's why Paul would write in 1 Thessalonians, but don't be ignorant, brother, concerning those who have, fall, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. In other words, he's saying those people who die in the faith, he said, don't be ignorant. Don't, we don't sorrow like everybody else. We have sorrow. We have grief. But if you've lost a loved one that served God, that has went to be with the Lord, we don't grieve like everyone else. He said, we don't grieve like those who have no hope. Why? Because we have hope. We have hope. We have an anticipation. And when I partake in communion, communion is about commemoration, but it's also about anticipation. I'm anticipating that one day I'm going to join our loved ones in the air. I'm going to join the saints that have gone on before. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For we say to you by the word of the Lord, verse 15, that we that are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those which are asleep who have already gone. For the Lord himself, verse 16, will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise First, anybody get excited thinking about that day? When then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall we always be with the Lord. And then he says, verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. When you look at what's on the news and something else has fallen apart in our world, comfort one another with these words. We are anticipating a new home. When you look at what's breaking out wars and rumors of wars, comfort one another with these words because we're anticipating that one day we're going to live in a new Jerusalem. One day we're going to rule and reign with him. One day we're going to realize that this world really is not our home. It was not our home. We're just passing through. Comfort one another with these words. Comfort. We have comfort tonight because communion is about anticipation. As we do this, we're remembering the Lord's death until he comes. That until he comes, it is his broken body and his shed blood that keeps us, that preserves us, that protects us until that day that we're caught up to meet him in the air. And finally, communion is about congregation. We identify with the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Paul said, as we identify, we, we self-examine. And we identify with the body of Christ and the shed blood, the body of Christ. We discern the Lord's body. Verse 29 says, for he who eats and drinks unworthily, or the New King James says, in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning or properly handling the Lord's body. Now, I, I, I grew up, and I, I don't know where I got this understanding, but I had a misunderstanding about communion as a child. And I remember at communion, I would, I would take communion in, in fear that... I was going to do it in some way that I would receive judgment, that I was going to somehow commit the unpardonable sin, and I was going to have this judgment mentioned here produced because I was not worthy, because maybe there was something I didn't change or repent of. Or, and, I, and, I, and I lived in fear every time we would have communion until one day the Lord showed me that I had misunderstood that all along. Watch this. Part of discerning the Lord's body 
is not just the bread and the fruit of the vine. But part of the discerning the Lord's body, first you have to understand, is understanding and recognizing and honoring his body in this earth. The proper understanding of the Lord's body is not that it's in a tomb. The proper understanding of the Lord's body is not that it's suspended somewhere in the stratosphere. The proper understanding of the Lord's body is not that it's up in heaven somewhere. The proper understanding of the Lord's body is that it's next to you on a chair and it's behind you and it's sitting in front of you. The kind of communion that brings damnation upon us is partaking of the symbolic body of Christ with no consideration for the body of Christ with no consideration for the actual broken body of Christ or the body of Christ on this earth. And Paul said to not discern the Lord's body properly or handle the Lord's body. He said they were doing this in Corinth. That's why he chastised them. And he said that's why some of you are are cursed with weakness and sickness and some of you even prematurely die. That's what he said right there. He said because you're mishandling the body. The concept of communion is that I better be careful how I handle the Lord's crucified body and I better be careful how I handle the Lord. How do I handle the Lord's crucified body? I don't, I can't touch it. I can't feel it. I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm not one of those that came to the tomb to wrap it. How do you handle the Lord's body? You handle the body of Christ in this earth. How do you handle the church? They drink unworthily, he said. They trample the body of Christ. They trample the body of Christ claiming to get to Christ. Brothers and sisters, you can't trample the church claiming to be Christ-like. You can pray in tongues until your tongue falls off its rollers and you cannot trample the body of Christ. You can't be right with God. You can't trample the body of Christ in this earth trying to be spiritual and get to Christ. You don't get to Christ without getting through the body of Christ. Well, okay. Yeah, that also flies in the face of a lot of a modern uh, spirituality uh, and philosophy. You can't get to the body of Christ. Uh, You can't get in the body without going through the body. Hear me. He said, be careful not to handle the body unworthily. Now, that's different than unworthy. Unworthily or in an unworthy manner is different than being unworthy. Unworthy, that word is an adjective. This is where I had a misunderstanding as a kid. That word's an adjective. It it means without merit, without value, without worthless, not deserving. Every one of us are unworthy. I'm unworthy. You're unworthy. But unworthily is different. It's an adverb, meaning irreverently, unfit, or in an unworthy manner. Unworthy is a condition. That's not what he's saying. But unworthily is a manner. It's an attitude. And what Paul's saying is you better not be irreverent when it comes to church. Mm. Okay. You better not be unreverent, irreverent when it comes to the things of God. Well, can I pastor for 30 seconds? We better be careful how we handle the things of God. That's why we don't, this, well, to the world, this is just another building. This is just another carpet. Uh, This is just other walls. Uh, But to us, this is sacred space. This is where we meet God. This is where we have encounters with God. Mm. Well, okay. I'm going to move on and I didn't get in trouble. But here, I, I know we got all kinds of new people coming to church. Uh, we got all kinds of people that don't know how to treat the house of God. Can I just say to the church folk, uh, you know how to treat the house of God. Don't start sliding and becoming like somebody who doesn't know. Don't start sliding and becoming like somebody who... 
doesn't know any better. We treat the house of God with respect. We treat the presence uh, of God with reverence. Well, I don't want to kill the message, but that, that's, why, that's why we're not talking and cutting up in church all service long. Well... I mean, I, I, I came into a church, I came into a church, if you, if you walked in church with gum in your mouth, well, I'm going to get in trouble, I just need to be quiet, move on. Uh, you walked into church with gum in your mouth, one of my old church mamas would say, spit it out. Yeah, yeah, you remember, yeah, they, you remember. I, I walked into church, man, and, and man, they didn't, they, you, you didn't come in irreverently, you didn't come in. Are, you all right? Everybody all right? I, I know it's a different day, and I, you know, I'm old-fashioned. I know, okay, and and I know now. Now we, I remember when you couldn't even bring water into the sanctuary. Anybody remember that? And I mean, now we live in a world, and I'm, I'm not saying we're getting ready to put a coffee shop in our foyer, so it's going to become an increasing problem. But but now you got people coming in with a five-gallon. Stanley and Slurpees and big gulps and spilling junk all over the carpet so that Sister Carrie's team has to clean it and shampoo it up in between service. I'm not preaching against bringing. I'm just saying we don't handle this space like I. Everybody okay? Everybody all right? We don't handle this space like any. Man, I, I, I grew up in church. We had some stairs like this, uh, and I know it's a different day. We're, and we're a kid-friendly church. We're going to stay that way. But I grew up in church, man. When I was little, if you even stepped up on that first step, one of them old church mamas would smack you upside the head. It wasn't, I mean, you didn't climb up on the platform. You can, Unless you were a minister, you were on the word, you get smacked. I'm not saying we start, don't smack some kid upside the head and say, Pastor told you to. You're going to start a fight, okay? going to bring out mama bear. But parents, we do good to teach our kids reverence for the house of God. That's why we don't walk into church with hoodies on and sunglasses and, 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 and our favorite team's ball cap on. And we don't, we don't do all that stuff in church. Why? Because we reverence the house of God, how we handle the Lord's house, how we handle the Lord's body, how we handle the things of God, the presence of God. It matters, folks. It matters. It matters. He said, you're handling the thing. But you know what? He, he said, M more important, I'm not just talking about handling the house of God. You know what he's really getting at? He's really getting at how you handle brothers and sisters in the Lord. Ah, uh, well, because somebody will get all amen and pastor when he talks about spitting gum or chewing gum or blowing bubbles in church. Uh, but you've been talking about a brother just today. You've been gossiping about a sister just today. You better be careful how you handle the body of Christ. Don't you dare handle a building more reverently than you handle a brother. Don't you dare handle a sanctuary more reverently than you handle a sister. Come on, it's midweek, but I'm preaching right now. We better be careful how we handle the body of Christ. How I handle you matters. How you handle me matters. Paul said, you Corinthian church, you're being disrespectful of the body. We live in a day of irreverence. We live in a day where, where there's cynicism everywhere. There's criticism everywhere. Let that not be in the body of Christ. Let that not be named among the saints. I cannot take communion irreverently with a cynical attitude towards the body of Christ while harboring unrepented sin. It matters. It matters that I repent of my sin as I prepare to take communion. But it also matters that I take care of the body Communion. I hope you hear my heart. I hope nobody walks out of here thinking, oh, pastor just gave us five do's and don'ts for the sanctuary. No, no, no. You do, you do what you feel to do, okay, with how you walk in here. I'm, I'm just talking to the church folk tonight. But what I'm telling you is 
we better have a reverent mindset about the house of God. This isn't the Moose Lodge. This isn't the American Legion post. This is a place where heaven and earth meet and lives are changed. And so as we come together today, we examine ourselves. We repent of anything in our hearts that would hinder us from approaching this communion in an unworthy manner. If I've mishandled the congregation, communion is about the congregation. It's about the body of Christ. He said, remember the body. Not just think back, but watch this. Remember. To remember is, all, is to think back, but you know what else it is? It's to put together again something that has been dismembered. And when I partake in communion, I'm remembering the body of Christ. I'm putting back together the body of Christ. The body that was broken at Calvary for our sins. When I treat you well, young people, this is why it matters how you talk to one another. How you talk about one another. That's why it matters the words you choose and the things that you say. It matters what we post and what we text. It matters. Because Paul said, if I handle my brothers and sisters in an irreverent or a careless manner, I will receive judgment. It matters how I handle you because how I handle you is how I'm handling the actual body of Christ. Oh, Jesus. Would you stand together with me right now? I'm inviting you as our, as our team that's going to serve communion begins to get into place. I'm inviting you just to lift up your voice, to bow your heads and begin to talk to the Lord right where you're at. Would you just say, Lord, help me to remember your body. Lord, help me to remember your body. God, help me to remember the price that was paid. God, help me to remember, Lord, this salvation that, that I view as free is a salvation that cost you everything. Oh, God. This would be a good time to purify your heart before the Lord, to bow your head, to close your eyes and say, Lord, cleanse me, wash me, purify me. I don't want to enter into this with an, an attitude that handles this unworthily, God. I don't want to enter this time of communion with an irreverent mindset. Oh, God, cleanse our hearts. Purify our spirits. Lord, if I've mistreated a brother or a sister, Lord, forgive me. Lord, if I've mistreated a child or an adult, forgive me. If I've mistreated my children, my spouse, Lord, my parents, come on, make it personal. Lord, forgive me, cleanse me for how I've handled your body. Hallelujah. If your heart's not right with God, come on, the thief on the cross proves that all you need to do is pray a prayer to make it right. All you have to do is bow your head and pray a prayer and say, Lord, purify me, wash me, cleanse me. And when you do that, weakness becomes strength. Bondage becomes freedom. Sickness can become health. In the name of Jesus, brokenness can become restoration. Lord, I pray, Lord, I give myself to you wholly, totally, completely. Hallelujah. 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 I'm going to invite you at this time, if you would like to partake in this time of communion together. If you consider yourself to be in a right 
relationship with God, if you're pursuing a right relationship with God, if you're reaching after a right relationship with God, none of us is perfect, but we should all be reaching for that right relationship. I invite you to step out of where you're at and to come gather around this altar and you can take the elements from, it'll be provided to you by one of our ministry team here and just don't open it just yet. Just take a step back as you receive it. Take a step back so that others can gather in. If you have children with you, it's up to every parent to decide whether or not that child is ready to receive the Lord's Supper. guest here today and you're reaching for a right relationship with God you're welcome to join in if you if you're repenting of your sins and reaching for relationship with him you're welcome to join just keep them closed for the moment two simple elements involved in communion the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine the unleavened bread or bread without yeast the unleavened bread or bread without yeast because when this was first instituted in Egypt at the time of Passover Egypt was being delivered and the Lord said I want you to cook a meal fast there's no time to let the yeast rise in the bread and I want you to remember with this bread that when I tell you to move it's time to move don't sit around thinking about your old life or your bondage when God tells you to get out you gotta get out quickly yeast was also a type of sin fruit of the vine the juice or the wine in this case grape juice represents the blood of Jesus while the bread represents harkens back to that unleavened bread in Egypt and and represents the broken body of Christ the fruit of the vine represents the blood that poured from his body as the thorns pierced his brow and the spear pierced his side a body that was broken and blood that flowed so that you and I could be delivered from our own Egypt so that you and I could be set free from sin and so we do this reverently we do this in submission and obedience and we do this in commemoration We do this in anticipation, reaching forward to that day that we're going to join with Him. And we do this in honor of the body, the congregation of Christ in this earth. So I would invite you to prepare the bread first if you'll just take out the wafer or wafers and hold them in your hand for a moment. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 for I received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on that same night that he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and he said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this Remembrance of me can partake of the bread. And if you'll gently peel back and prepare the juice. And in that same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, 
this is the cup, the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you do it in remembrance of me. And when you partake of this fruit of the vine tonight, we're remembering his blood that was shed to bring us out of our own Egypt. You can partake of the juice. Jesus, we worship you. Oh, Jesus, we're so grateful tonight. God, we give you praise. God, the sacrifice that cost you all, that is so freely given to us. Oh, would you lift up your voice and would you just begin to give him thanks for it? it. Just entertain his presence. Just thank him for his mercy and his goodness. Lord, I worship you. God, I'm not worthy of your goodness. I'm not worthy of your grace. God, I'm broken. I'm flawed. Lord, I've, God, I've made more mistakes than I can count. But God, I'm so grateful tonight. I'm so grateful tonight. I'm so grateful tonight. Hallelujah. Lord, I want to remember your teaching. Lord, I want to remember your birth. I want to remember your life. I want to remember your death. God, I want to remember the body of Christ, though time and tribulation and persecution has tried to dismember the body throughout time. Lord, we remember your body. God, we put it back together in unity tonight. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us online today. My name is Luke Levine, and I serve as the pastor of the Sanctuary Quad Cities. If you'd be interested in additional content like this, sermons, lessons, worship, and more, you can find them on our YouTube channel or any podcasting platform. You can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, Or we'd love for you to join us in person right here at 1501 John Deere Parkway. You can find all of that information on our website at thesanctuaryqc.com. From there, you can also request a free personal Bible study. We'd love for you to grow into all that Jesus Christ has for you in your life. Until we meet you in person, we pray God's blessing on you and yours.